me on Friday because it goes on. I'm on a seven day shift. But for those of us who are able to conclude your work day on a Friday, I'm so happy for you. But the truth of the matter is you're getting ready to get the young people back to school. You're probably going to pursue your entrepreneurial efforts this fall. Everything that you're doing, we're just happy to usher in this new day of opportunity and conversation that we know is going to be impactful. So great, amazing morning to you. You are officially tuning in to Coffee and Conversation with Colette, and I'm Colette, and you know I'll do my curtsy. That's what I do to show reverence to you, because as I know and I tell you, you could be anywhere having conversations with yourself. You're not going to actively engage with a television station because you know that they don't speak the way we speak. They don't deal with the truth the way that we deal with the truth. Or, or when you assess what they say to you, you know why and how they say it. Because the underlying factor with everything, if you didn't know, now you know, is money. It's the business of government. You talk about the Amazon forest, and it's the business of government because they need to burn out the crops so that they can replenish and grow other crops because they have a plan for what they want in their region, but those of us who want to come in and control things want to tell them what to do and what that looks like. But isn't that who we always are? Isn't that what America has done? The four founding fathers of America created revenue based off of slavery because they knew that they needed someone to govern, to do the work, to create wealth. And so then we took that model and took it over every place else. Remember, confessions of an economic hitman. So what I'm going to do is go into your region, identify what you need to be uh, up and functional, whether it's electricity, whether it's internet, Wi-Fi, running water, all those things, ha adequate housing, adequate education. I'm going to bring in all my powerhouse corporate monies to infuse into your system, to control your system, for, and then put a 30, 40 year price tag on it and say that, yeah, we'll have to monopolize this industry to help you get up and to par for the next 30 years, and then you'll be able to sustain your yourself as a society. Well, how will you be able to sustain yourself as a society when you've never had the experience in that industry then to be able to craft a business model that looks like that to ensure that there is a purposeful and seamless transition? So normally that never happens because the system wasn't established to teach you how to adequately know what they know to do exactly what they do. The system was established to be able to give you a job and so that you can do the best functionality in that position. And then you say that that works for you and that you're complete. And then you get the check for 30 years of service. And then you retire. And then that's what you do. Well, not on today. So the conversation on today is if we understand all of those things <laughs> and you're not, I'm a little afraid to say it because I, you know, this thing right here is a powerful tool. This phone. Because you all don't have to call this phone, but you call this phone. And this phone, and I don't have a problem with it. You see the numbers on the screen. I want you to call this phone. So we can have the same conversations that you all have with me on this phone. Because today, I'm going to suggest, and I'm going to ask you, have you learned to be happy in your place? Traumatized and black in America. <laughs> so look, and 
I giggle, I can snicker because I can imagine the thoughts that are going in your mind. Because yesterday I tried to be light and easy with us. I talked about love and if there are boundaries in love and what our commitment to love is. And I gave an example of B. Smith and her husband Dan who are dealing with the Alzheimer's disease after some 57 years of marriage. And for his development, and he gave the statistics that seven out of every 10 caregivers for people, loved ones who are um, thrown in with the phrase of the Alzheimer's disease die before that actual loved one does because of the stresses and the trauma for that experience or the incompleteness of who they are, the stimulations, because he gave the example. What do you do when the person that you love no longer relates to you the way that you are used to relating to them? And so you're not able to sit and watch a movie and discuss it. You're not able to sit and read to each other and have those comforting close times. So then does that mean because that is not good for your health and perhaps what your ideas were until death do us part, then it's an understanding that you need support and companionship outside of the people that are the support to the caregivers. You want your own companion still. And so he has a companion, his girlfriend. And so he has a girlfriend. So he has a girlfriend as he has a wife, as he loves and cares for his wife in a, as they phrase, in a childlike state, then he can get adult love and companionship and compassion from his wife. And so I asked you all yesterday, and you're very quiet on these lines, but you blew me up on these lines. On this little cell phone line, it was Colette. Well, uh, someone shared with me that they believe it's disgusting and disingenuous that it's till death do us part. And so if she is not dead yet, how dare you disrespect the vows? Because no matter sickness and in health, you all know the vows, those of you who've been married. I've never been married. I didn't give that oath before God and my loved ones. But you all know what it's supposed to be. Death do you part, no matter sickness and in health, rich or poor, uh, skinny or hefty. You, 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 I could add all kinds of things into that dynamic. No matter what the scenario is, I'm supposed to be there to hold you down, and we're supposed to love each other and get through this thing called life to the best journey that we know possible. And so on yesterday, you all were kind of quiet on that because I don't know if you really cared about that, or perhaps you were just trying to process it because you never thought about it. And maybe the bigger issue is that we don't know how to love each other in any aspect, potentially, because we don't really know how to love ourselves. And so maybe that's what it boiled down to. And I said, well, okay, I'm going to take it from there. And if indeed, we, and we can throw in, because, you know, it's Friday, and we have two hours. And so we can throw in all these other aspects if we want to as well. But how do you, so maybe the truth of the matter is we couldn't talk about that because we have learned to be in our place. And our place in America causes us to question or to not question anything. So our place positions us in that, okay, it's uh, our goal. My job is to get educated by your system, not to think. My job is to get employed by your system based on the criteria that you give me. And then I do that to the best of my ability. And I keep trying to uh, thrive through this corporate ladder, you know, all the analogies that they give, even though we know that there's this glass ceiling, there's this proverbial ceiling, a space that you can never amount to and surpass if you are a person of color in these Americas, but we're going to keep being aspirational and we're going to try that. And then I will say that my life here is done because I've learned how to be happy in my place. And in all those areas, for me, and I'm suggesting to us today, that they show or we are not aware that we are traumatized. In all of those areas, we're traumatized. We're traumatized in the ideology of trying to prepare your children to go off to university in a space that they're not familiar with, trying to adapt into a culture that they might not be accustomed to, to try to then learn information and to grasp an educational system, to then be able to get the grades, to pass through the system, to get degreed, and then the trauma then of being a person of color, trying to get employment and, and the inadequacies. But we're consistently traumatized. But we don't look at it that way. We don't look at the fact that there, now get a load of this. <clears throat> and maybe I just don't understand the newspapers. Maybe I don't read the way everyone else reads. But I just saw one article that says that what? Um, half of Michigan's third graders, um, <coughs> excuse me, children can't 
uh, learn can't read past the third grade. Let me get you the correct title because I do not want to misquote anything at it as it was presented in print. And so this is something to me that was traumatic. More than half of Michigan third graders fail in reading. So that was a report from the Detroit News. So let me give that. More than half of Michigan third graders fail in reading. So that's Michigan. We have millions of residents in Michigan. More than half fail in reading. So that means that that is across socioeconomic status. That is across the color line. That is across the board. Then more than half of Michigan third graders are failing. But then there's another article that states, Detroit students improve reading math scores across all tested grades. You can't have both. So either all of half of Michigan is failing third graders, but then Detroit students are improving. Does that make sense? Or improving based on what? Based on the numbers that are of the half of, uh, that are failing out of Michigan, that our numbers are improving? But we're traumatized. Inadequate education is traumatic. Poor neighborhoods is traumatic. I believe, and, and I commend everyone who is up in the morning trying to take their children to school, not sitting there and telling them, or in the bed, sleep. Let me just start there. Not in the bed, sleep, and the child is up trying to get themselves together, and they're walking out in the darkness of the morning trying to get to school. You all know children are about to start school. Like, do you have a plan for them to be successful in the school year? As an adult, are you working to empower them right now to prepare? Because if I have to get up, I have to figure out if there's any food for me, how I'm going to eat, I have to figure out my clothes, I have to figure out the supplies and things that I'm going to take with me, then I have to go out into the world in the morning, it's dark, Heaven forbid if I have other siblings that I have to care for, that I have to go make sure that I'm being responsible to the best of my ability as a child to then get us to the bus or to get us to school, to then get us in a space where then now we can be captive to this educator who is supposed to infuse all of this information and knowledge. And callers, I see I'm going to get to you momentarily. That's a scenario. Or you have the parent that says, no matter what, if they're working, we're up together. I'm going to get the energy together because we prepared the night before. Now, these are all lessons. So we prepare the night before and we get up in the morning and we have your food and we make sure that your energy is good and that you feel empowered. And that means that I need to feel good and make sure my energy is good and empowered as an adult to bring that to you. And then after that, we get ready and collectively we're in the car, we're walking or whatever we're doing, the bus, to get us to this place of education. And we're having the conversation about you having a great day and you being brilliant and being open to information and knowledge is power and make sure you speak up when you don't have questions and um, when you don't have the answers or you have questions and there's no such thing as a dumb question and we have that group as we're preparing but maybe the truth of all of that is, is can you adequately prepare your children and the students if you don't do that as an adult or maybe you don't even think about it because you're just happy and content in this space because if you didn't get it from your parents or your family or however you were cared for, then you don't even know you have a consciousness that you didn't, but you don't make sure that your children get that same thing. Are we happy and complacent? Let me tell you all, I was in a space yesterday and a young lady had uh, three children. She was uh, sitting behind us and I see the children were probably... Uh, just started probably because uh, the young girl was in a uniform. So maybe five or six. Maybe a little boy, maybe five, six, maybe they were like five, six, seven, and then it was a younger girl, a toddler. So you could tell that the mother was a little disheveled. Okay, fine. She's trying to get the children to sit down, and she told the baby, sit the F down. And I just was appalled. I said, we are out in a public place, and you tell the child to sit the F down, Right? And then you go on to talk to the other one. Well, that's why you're effing up in school, because this is how you act now. You need to sit there and hold my purse. That's what you need to do. And then she went to tell the other lady that was sitting to the other side of her, oh, I, I'm tired. It's been a full day. You're tired? And I'm thinking, I'm like, well, this is what you share. This is what you, how you speak to your children when you are in that space with them. Who knows what you tell them when you're at home? 
And then when the child gets to school and they tell somebody else to sit the F down and then you get a call from the school, then you're going to wonder why and where they got that language from because that's what you tell them all the time. I don't know if you also, are, it's, and that's this place of normalcy for us. That's the place of us being complacent. I don't know if you all saw on social media there was a clip that the young girl, it looked like she wasn't even in kindergarten, and she was telling her, the mama was video, all y'all girls at the school, I'm going to fight. I'm fighting y'all, I'm fighting y'all, I'm fighting y'all. This little girl looked like she might, she clearly probably wasn't even in kindergarten. And her conversation was, I'm fighting you, I'm fighting you, I'm fighting you when we get to school. And her mother is asking her, well, why are you saying that? And little girl said, period. Like every time the mother would try to get some answer, little girl said, period, period, period. I'm fighting you, I'm fighting you, I'm fighting you. Where did she get that from? And so that's the shenanigans and the buffoonery that we have become accustomed to. So that's a norm for us. Or I'll do it, I'll say you one better, because those are children and they learn from adults. Maybe us as adults who just sit and complain about what everybody else does all the time in this system. Now, these are the people who've done the work to get the power to create the business, to establish whatever the product or service is, but we're the ones chastising them. Oh, well, they should do it this way. Well, why haven't they met with so-and-so? Well, why haven't they? Well, let me tell you this much. Maybe they don't have to because they've done what they needed to do to create this type of success right now. And all you get from them is a check. So if all you get from them is a check, when did you become the, in the position that you can act like you're the CEO or you're the executive director? When you're sitting back, you didn't put the hard work in to establish it. You didn't have the idea to be able to monetize and create a product or service that then creates a business out of the relationships. You didn't think and put that work in. All you did is show up, create an opportunity maybe for volunteer into a job, and now you want to sit back and critique what they're supposed to do. We do that all the time. And we, then we tell all our friends and family, oh, they're not doing this. They don't do that. That's like the cannabis business. I'm not going to sit here and have a problem with the rest of the folks who have the resources and then say, oh, well, because that's why we don't have resources. So that's why we're not going to go anywhere with it. No. That's why I created Cannabis TV. That's why I created Cannabis, discussing the business of cannabis as a TV show. That's why I created CASE, the Cannabis Association for Social Equity, because we will not find people in any space that have an idea or an ideology as it pertains to cannabis, and you work to create that work, but you haven't had the experience, and then you partner in with identifying partnerships with established entities who have the expertise and the wealth, because that's how we leverage the social equity. What good is it if you're in a community, and, and shout out to Massachusetts, what good is it if you have permits sitting on the table, but you have the people who are disadvantaged, who never have had the experience, they're not mentored, you haven't created a mentorship program, opportunity to create that reality for business development, that's why you only have five permits right now. But maybe again, for us, we've been taught how to be complacent. We've taught that happy place is that we're consistently traumatized. We're consistently less than. We consistently work for somebody else. We consistently use our ideas to make their ideas better. And we just complain and we just get a check. We never have ownership. We never create anything. And if we do, we don't put in the work to get it done. We don't sacrifice to get it done. I tell people all the time, as it pertains to specifically the cannabis business, you have to sacrifice for yours. In any business, you all know starting a business, you don't make a return in the first six, seven months. You're lucky after the expenses if you're able after two years to try to get a profit. You work to plan to keep the lights on and the doors open. When we had the conversation about the avenue of fashion and, and talking about what they should have had in that space. No, what they should have had is a viable business model that understands and forecasts if you are basing your clientele on the major thoroughfare, what does this look like in six months, eight months? What kind of development is coming through here? What does construction look like? But you have to have an acumen to be able to understand business and forecasting to ensure that you're successful. But maybe not because we've learned to be happy in this place of being traumatized and black in America. 
That's why I'm asking. I can meet us wherever we are. That's no different than if you go to church or you go to the mosque or you go to the synagogue. Whatever that looks like for you and your spaces of worship and you believe that this person who is there as a representative is going to be the one that gives you salvation. And you say, well, I go to church every Sunday or I go to the mosque or I go on Wednesdays and, and then I do all these things based on what they tell you to do. And then you think that that is going to be the salvation for you in your life versus the soul and the spirit of the inner man and the inner woman that is your connection to a higher power, not the bishop or the iman or none of that. But maybe because of what you've been taught, you're just complacent in that happy place. A lot of times... We're traumatized by religion, the oppressiveness of religion. That's a control mechanism as well of religion. I didn't say spirituality. I didn't say relationship. I said religion. That means doctrine. That means all the different versions that people created of the Bible, and then you're supposed to adhere to that and not have any connection with spirit, and then that keeps you oppressed. It's no different. Remember when we talked about Nat Turner and, and what he was charged to come in to get paid to tell the slaves to use verses in the Bible to say you're supposed to obey your masters and your days will be long. Now, I'm raped, beaten, muzzled, demoralized, dehumanized, kind of keep going on and on, and I'm just supposed to keep sitting here and obeying you because that's what the Bible said, because that's what God said, and so I'm supposed to do that. And in my trauma place, I'm complacent, and I'm supposed to be happy. And that's why we can with all those spirituals when we were in the cotton fields and to sit to try to give us strength to keep making it through these hard days and these long, arduous nights in the hopes of something better when we die in the great by and by. And so maybe those of us now, the cotton fields have become the corporate boardrooms or they become the factory workplaces or the servicemen floors in any place or even the classroom that you go to then be employed and hope that it's something better later because you've been groomed in the trauma of being happy. You've been taught that in this trauma, I'm supposed to be happy. I'm asking, what do you have to share with us this morning? Great morning to you. Oh, you are on fire. Thank you. I felt like that today. Six, I felt like that. Well, I'm glad you did because there's <laughs> a lot of people who should feel like that. Okay. And you shouldn't be the only one. You know, <laughs> let's talk about the school thing and the parenting. Please. I talked about this on your show a couple of times mm -hmm. about how these women talk to these kids. Mm hmm And people look at me like I'm stupid. You know, Shahzad Ali said that, you know, um, black, some black women have been shielded from critiquing. Yeah. Everyone has been critiqued, but the black woman, the white man, the black man, the white child, the white woman, and the white child, everyone has been critiquing. But when it comes to the sisters, yes. for some reason, even now, we were still protected. I know a guy who got stabbed. Mm. Now, his woman ain't had no business stabbing him. He didn't put his hands on her. Right. He just made her mad. Okay. And even in his trauma, as he was talking to her, us, he went from, I want to kill her, I want to kill her, too. Well, you know what, man, maybe I did piss her off that bad. <laughs> and so that justified her stabbing him up? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Now, if he stabbed her or slapped her, there's an apology. Yeah. Yeah. Her, well, don't make, well, don't make me mad. See, here's what I want people to understand. It's yeah. no get down on nobody. It's a get down on a spirit that has captured a lot of our sisters. Yeah. And because of that spirit that they are entertaining, it has leaked into our children. And now you're only mm -hmm. seeing female versions of your children, male and female. So your son come out all moody and indecisive and not, don't know how to make proper choices or what to do in per certain situations. Mm. Then you have our daughters who don't know love or don't know nurturing or even no type of compassion because yeah. our children are not seeing that. Yeah. Yet this same person who's not imparting these things that is in the best interest of the child is the custodial parent for the prime reasoning of the prison industrial complex because yeah. under this type of stress, there's no way the child could be successful. Yeah. Yeah. Under this type of stress, there's no way the child could be productive. So if we keep the narrative that, well, 
It's never your fault. It's his fault. Yeah. You will build the world around <laughs> everything me. else, and now you are on autopilot, which is why you saw that sister speak to her children as if they were their fathers. Right. Or some guy she broke up with. Not like, you know, most people think that we, they're good parents. Let me tell you what a good parent starts at. Okay. It don't start when you become a parent. Right. A good father, I tell my brothers, I told my son, a good father begins with you being good to yourself. Ah. If you suck treating yourself, you're going to suck treating a child. Yeah. Bottom line, you can't treat yourself like crap and then say, but when I had this baby, that is going to be different. <laughs> Be you can't different. say, uh, you cannot love yourself and not love everybody, but say, I'm going to love this child. Yes. yes. I hate the father, but yes. I'm going to love the child. Yes. You can't do that. Yes. Only on planet Stupo do that work. On planet Earth, you cannot love and hate at the same time. Right. You cannot love, uh, even Jesus said, you can't love the father, but hate the son. Right. You know, but right. this is the norm, like you say, has become the norm. And the reaction to the trauma, and the reaction to that trauma also is coupled with, I don't want to know what's better, because if I have to know what's better, then that means I'm held accountable to do what's better. Yeah. What's wrong with getting up in the morning and seeing your children off to school? That shouldn't even be a question. Right. When it comes to the children, period, you would think it's no question as to why we don't have meals for them. That shouldn't even be a question. Certain things should just not be a question, but they are questions because yeah. the parents today are questionable. Uh -huh. And ain't nobody saying that. We so busy protecting. Well, if that father was there, well, if he was there, would she have let him make the difference? Ah. See, here, that's another conversation. That's a, I, I was about to what? say, you said it, Six. You can't start that conversation without what. Ah. So, did you Ooh. all hear what Six said? Because, again, we have to go back from a historical perspective. We talked about coming up out of slavery, this alleged physical emancipation. What was the first order as told? The what? The reemergence of the connection, the insulation of the black family, right? To get us back together. I don't understand why you all think it's cute. Let me tell you, Six, on that point, I tell you, and this is the same space my, my mother and I, good morning, mama was right there. We were at the Secretary of State. This is where the lady was cursing the kids out behind us. I felt like we were in a space where there was like a pregnancy pack. You remember when you all seen those movies on Lifetime? Like they made an agreement. I tell you, it seemed like every woman that came through that door was pregnant. And these are young women, young girls. And forgive me, first thing I did was look on their finger. I said, okay, let me see if they're married. Let me see. I didn't see anything. So... And that doesn't mean that there isn't a partner around. I don't know. But do you all understand the severity of what you are undertaking? Do you understand how important it is to be a parent? Even if you had a quote-unquote positive upbringing, it is challenged, I'm presuming. And heaven forbid if you had one with all these challenges, then you want to jump up out here solo? Solo dolo. To raise a child? Correct, hey. because they don't, they, they underestimate or almost never think that. Like one girl told me, I, could, I take care of my child. I put food on their table. I put clothes on their back. I take them to school. I say, that's maintaining. Ah. Anybody with money can maintain. Ah. I say, it takes a, to raise a child properly, Colette. It takes a parental coalition. Yeah, who you tell it? Coalition. Say it. It coalition. takes the village. You, you, you got to spell that word out for it. It takes a coalition, <laughs> meaning it takes more than one. Yeah. Yes, mama. It takes more than one. That's why you're at uh, James H. Lincoln crying, cussing your kids out, even down there. They're yeah. doing the same thing. When I was notarizing down there, they was doing the same thing. But I tell my brothers the same thing, though. Yeah. So it ain't just as I tell them. I said, man, the reason why things are the way they are is because your absence is allowing this void in your children's Say life. It, you have to somewhere, somehow, force your way into that child's life, whether it be on the LSEO at school, the PTO at school, be on the junior basketball team, leave with him, her. Something men are going to have to do 
force their way into these children's lives so these children can get a fair advantage of what it's like to have two adults <laughs> advising them, co-advising them, counseling them, and working with them. Single mother parenting, for the most part of it, let's just agree, it failed us. Mm. Stop thinking it worked for us. It even failed the football star because none of them fools can keep a wife. <laughs> and and wait, the and stay, wait, let, let's make none of them can keep a wife. Right. Let's let's make an addendum to that. And single parent dads as well. There are a it's, lot of parents, parents, right, single mothers and fathers. But maybe to Six's point, I want you all to get it because it's always bigger than this. Maybe you should think about that before you lay down with the people. Do you yeah, realize, go. like, I was having a conversation uh, with some folks, and I said, I'm not trying to be funny. And it's a phenomenal woman, and she's 44. She has a son in high school. She has one in middle school. And she's pregnant now with twins. And she wow. said, my husband and I were having a conversation. We have a high schooler now. He's going to be able to drive and drop the middle schooler off. And we're about to move into our relationship time for us. And then I come and find out that I'm pregnant. Now, mind you, she's married and then now pregnant with twins at 44. And we're talking about planning. Hello? If there's certain acts that you participate in and there is no barriers in those acts, what do you think the outcome is going to be? That's like rolling the dice. 7-Eleven. I mean, that's what we're doing. It's just caca. Like, that's what you're doing, right? <laughs> so I'm just asking. Like, so let, before the children even get here, if your mindset isn't that this is someone that you're committed to and that because of your commitment and your union, then that you are equipped collectively to have a child, Come on, y'all. I'm just asking across decision. the board, how does that work? <laughs> well, man, they don't see you made a bad decision <clears throat> on bringing the child here. What makes you think you're going to make good decisions while the child is here? It was a bad decision on how you got him. Oh, how, how you, you got, got the him. baby. Oh, right. We love her. Oh, yeah, we love him now. Oh, yeah, we say that now. Oh, yeah, but we love Right. First, how, how do we get them? We didn't know. There wasn't no love there. No. And, and, and no one wants to talk about that aspect of our relationship and how this affects the growth of our children and how they become productive, whether they'll become productive or not productive. We take them to school, and basically we take them to school to drop them off. We're not taking Jeez. them to school with the idea that there's something here. And there's a prayer. Like I tell my son, I say, I'm not sending you to school to be the smartest summa cum laude. I'm sending you to be the smartest social person. Mm. These are the future. Everybody you with today is the future. You ah. need to learn to get along with them. Yes. Yeah, there's the teacher. You yes. need to get along with her. You need yes. to know what less. And outside of that, as yes. a parent, you have to have an adjunct education going yes. on for your child. Yes. You yourself have to say, you know what? I'm not drinking with my boys tonight. Yes. On Wednesdays, every hour, I'm going to get with my son, and I'm going to read the dog next door with him. Every week, I'm going to get with my daughter, and I'm going to ask her what's going on in her life. Yes. You, as a parent, have to look at the crap that really ain't making you anything anyway and say, this is what I'm going to do. Yes. I've done it. When my son was born, I left. I was, I was owning a cab at that time. Okay. That day, I left the cab at the company. I left it. When he was born, I left it. I said, I can't do that in this. Yes. Yes. I got to do. I say I have to put my foot to the heel one more time, and it's this, especially in this generation, it's yes. critical. It is important that both parents be mentally fit before they do this. Say it's it. What I tell people, it is imperative. Say so it. important. You must be mentally fit. Say and I don't it. mean because you make money that makes you fit. That Say just it. makes you able, yet don't mean you're fit. You have Say to be it. mentally fit and ready for this. You Say have it. to know the undertaking. I asked my, my own niece, I said, baby number one was hard. I don't know why you had baby number two. That almost drained you. Baby number three, what were you thinking? Baby number four, are you superwoman? What is going on? How long am, am, am I to think mm. for you? Why we'll stay, the we'll stay there six. You want us to do the smart thing. We'll stay there six, and maybe that's a mm. conversation because I, um, 
I don't know if you all listened to uh, Nephew Tommy in the morning, right? So yesterday there was, yeah, he did a prank. And he pranked this young woman. He called and said he was calling from the church and that she comes into service late and the pastor was complaining because it was disrupting the service. And so she can't keep coming in late. And if she does, they're going to charge her $15 every time she's late. And she's like, well, what are you talking about? First of all, I have three young children. It's just me. I'm trying to get them together. She went on and said, well, daddy number one ain't nothing. Daddy number two is in jail. Daddy number three left seven months ago. His word didn't mean anything. And he took my purse with them, with him. The car broke down and I'm on the bus with the kids trying to get them to church. And so I'm trying to do the best that I can do. Did you hear that scenario? And it goes oh. into Six's conversation. Daddy number one, daddy number two, daddy number three. So if you keep looking for somebody to save you, and you think the dynamic of being saved as an adult is going to come through creating a child to create a relationship, newsflash, didn't work then, doesn't work now. How many times have you had conversations? I've had tons of conversations with men that say, I didn't want my child to be here the way that they're here, but now that they're here, I love them. I didn't oh. want those children. I didn't want those children, but I couldn't control how they got here, but I love oh. them when they're here. Well, the, you don't interact with the mamas, so you don't have nothing to do with the mamas. So the mamas were okay to have sex with and then impregnate, and then when she gets pregnant, then you don't want her to have a baby. She says that she's making a choice to have the baby. So now you don't interact with her and a child is here. And so the dynamic of adults, because maybe that's the bigger issue, is because you got to get yourself together as an adult. Because if you can't get yourself together as an adult, what do you think that's going to teach the child? You all get that? I was having, and I, you all know I'm transparent. And all the lines are lit. I'm going to get to everybody. We have two hours today. I was having some conversation with my parents yesterday. And my mother said, well, your dad talks to you about stuff he doesn't talk to me about. I said, well, guess what? He talks to me about stuff that he might not talk to you about. You talk to me about stuff that you don't talk to him about. And I, as the child, have to facilitate you all learning how to communicate with each other. And all due respect, it's easy to talk about stuff when it's uh, S and G. You all know those, what that stands for, S and giggles. That's great. We he ha 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 and everything is lovey dovey and ha ha. And you can talk about the rain and the sun and oh, what you going to do today. That's easy. But when it comes to that critical stuff, I need you to be able to open up your mouth and talk about the critical stuff. I need you to be able to open your mouth and talk about are you equipped as a person to best manage you to Six's point. And then if you're able to manage you and you're clear about you, then you can talk about trying to manage another human being. Like, that's a life. They didn't ask to be brought here. I, you all know, when I was in the relationship with the man who had custody of his two boys and was raising those boys four and seven at the time, when it was school time, they lived in Southfield. I was up in the morning to their house. By the time them little jokers was ready to get up, I had music going on. We'd have jazz morning brunch, breakfast. I'd have the jazz music playing. I'd go in their rooms, sit on their beds, gracefully and peacefully welcome them into this new world, rub their back, good morning, good morning, brilliant young man, good morning, getting their energy up so they could laugh and be happy and wake up and hug them and have home-cooked breakfast and waffles and have talk about the music of the day and then what their day was going to be like for school, get them little jokers in the car, talk about what was going to be educational today at school, at current events, the news cycle, and then drop them off at school. Those were my biological kids. But I take the ownership for that because children deserve a chance, man. They deserve a chance. Or if not to Six's point, when you got them locked up or they looking crying for their mama when they about to get sentenced, and then you wonder, oh, well, I failed my baby. You sure right you did. And that was on you. That's on you. So what part of you then will take responsibility for this trauma? We can't keep talking about how we got here. We know how we got here. 
We know what this looks like. And we keep creating this cycle that falls into the same thing, and then you wonder how the children become those same adults, the same dysfunction. Six, I appreciate you. Did I lose you? Oh, I lost them. All the lines are lit. Let's go. Let me give us a quote. We're talking about trauma, how it creates violence. That's the whole saying with uh, our honorable uh, remember Malcolm X when he was Detroit Red, but the conversation was uh, when the chickens come home to roost. Is that what he shared? What we're seeing right now in the violence, specifically in Baltimore, the trauma, folks are now shooting police officers. They, no, dis, no regard for the police and the authority. So you know when the population says, I've crossed the threshold, and now I don't have a problem with shooting you, something's happening. Let me give us a quote from John F. Kennedy. Those who make peaceful revolution impossible make violent revolution inevitable. You get that? So it's all going to turn. That's like in Megatrends, Megatrends 2000, Megatrends Asia. Those are books that talk about creating a nomadic society. It's not that the world is coming in to an end with brimstone and fire as foretold as the stories in the Bible. It is the difference in, in life and socioeconomic status, the haves and the have-nots. And so then when you're traumatized, that trauma isn't addressed, then you become in a space of disillusion Then I'm going to by any means necessary. So I'm going to start killing everybody. I don't have anything to lose. It's a nomadic society. Let me see what you have to say. Thanks for your patience. Good morning. Good morning, Queen. Good morning, Kink. Excellent subject as usual. Thank you. You know, Queen, but, the, you know, the bottom line is understand the, 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 what we fail to really look at is the programming hmm. and 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 we don't realize that uh, that our brain 14 billion brain cells and we don't understand we have not learned the science of of the programming of uh, our brains or whatever and how uh we are indoctrinated into uh, our world that we <coughs> continued in that cycle or whatever and so you know, it's like one of the Joshua's. The Joshua's used to say, "Give me, give me your child between the ages of six and seven, okay. and I'll make him into man." Because at those formative years or whatever of a child, yeah. that brain is actually the subconscious is actually recording everything. Yes, it's recording the parents, it's recording all its surroundings, and so you wonder why I understand children are the way they are. Well, look sure. at the world that we live in. Sure. When you look at, when you look at, understand television. And you understand the word television, understand, yeah. you know, our, 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 our father taught us in, the, in 1930, he said that the devil would entertain you in your living room. And yeah. we didn't understand what, really what he was refer referring to, but he was really referring to the television. Yes. And so it's actually programmed and whatnot. Yes. When, then when you think about it, understand, you, you depend on a system to educate your children. Now, these are the very people who traumatized you yes. for the last 464 years. Yes. And so you, didn't, you, you, you want to talk about love. Well, how do you talk about love when you've never been loved? And, or, or understand love, because all your life, understand, you've been traumatized. You've been, put in, you've, been, you've been traumatized to a certain point that is all in your cells, all in your very makeup. Yes. You know, and so we wonder why we continue to have the problems. But look at who benefits from it. Yes. We, we get in relationships. It don't work. But those who understand know the condition that we're in, they have the lawyers waiting, they have the, the, the courts waiting to buy up what you didn't accumulate it, and we continue to fall and keep a world going, and we still don't see what's actually going on. Yes. And, you know, and we're so fearful, we're so fearful of, of accepting the fact that we've been made into them. Yes. You know, the book says that Babylon... Baby lion became a habitation of devils. Yes. And so we've been made into little devils. The big devil made us into little devils. Yes. If you think, if we just, just be honest with our own selves and think about even how we think and think about one another, it's always in a negative thought. Yes. And we have over 50 trillion cells in our bodies. Yes. And you have positive protons and neutrons, negative and positive. And so, yet understand those cells understand within in the individual cells are able to survive on their own. Yes. But the fifty trillion come together in this magnificent 
uh, vessel that God has put his spirit in, and he put this in such a, a magnificent way that we never even try to sit back and even try to understand it. Of course. We don't, we don't even try to understand our brain and how we think and why we think the way we think. Yes. King, so we, King, stay there one second, and I want you all to understand, if you haven't picked up a book, it's an amazing book called Super Brain by Deepak Chopra, and you know there's a difference between the mind and the brain. Absolutely. See, we, we don't even understand that. So, so let's, let's talk about uh, ah, yeah. Because I don't even know if you all understood where he was going when he first opened his mouth to share those words with us. There's a difference between the mind and the brain. If you don't understand how you process, how information comes to you, then you definitely can't dissect the information that comes to you, then that is called allegedly knowledge, then that you're supposed to take that and use that to govern, and then you wonder why you're doing what it is that you're doing. If you're in a traumatized state and the school systems don't work for you, as I just said, what, half of the third graders in Michigan can't read? And so then it creates this ongoing cycle, so the trauma of that is not, not by design. So then if you are traumatized, you don't get the educational system, you can't meet the qualifications for employment, you can't gainfully then take care of yourself, so then you go to other means, which either will, majority of us, end in death or incarceration, and the business of con con uh, incarceration then keeps us housed and imprisoned, and monies, more monies are spent per prisoner than they are on education, but this is America, and so are we then becoming complacent in the trauma of who we are in America? America. You all see how it fits together? King, please continue. You, you, and, and you know, mm -hmm. uh, you, when we sit back and understand it, and, and we, like I said, not to know our history, mm -hmm. we, you know, we, we left uh, the Sphinx out there, which is uh. the body of a lion yes. in the face of a black man. Yes. And anybody know the nature of a lion? A lion is, is fearless. Yes. He's the most a uh, 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 dominant uh, beast in that continent or whatever. When he roars, understand everybody's frightened yes. or everybody understands that he means business when he roars. He should. And then you think about it, on the face is the black man. Yes. And so uh, the, the, the face of the black man, when Napoleon went over, he was so angry because he saw and what it symbolized because it, it, I think the name is Habu, a hawk. <laughs> But which means the black, the father of all. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and so until we take our, or are put into our rightful place, sure. and we can't expect the very people that put us in the condition that we're in to change it. Sure. And so when we, you know, you're talking about religion. Yes. And when you talk about God. Yes. And when you talk about God, God is man and man is God. Yes. God is woman and God is woman. Yes. You know, and so yes. depending on who's operating and who's controlling, it all depends because yes. Satan lives in, in each and every one of us. Yes. You know, and it's like, understand, when you go around negative people or whatever, they would zap your positive. So say that. Wait, 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 King. The negative world. Okay, say that, King. Stay right there, everyone. Did you hear what he said? You better guard your energy. You better guard you it. Hear what he said. Guard your energy. It is as crucial and critical as everything in your life. I know you all have been in spaces where as soon as certain folks walk in, the mood changes. The energy is <clears throat> negative. It's static. It's confrontational. It's destructive. It's dangerous. Don't shy away from that. That's real. Because it will have an impact on you. You know as you start talking to people and you'll start up with a great conversation and next thing you know, everything is combative. And you're like, well, where did this come from? All we were talking about was how to successfully move something forward. They didn't come up with the idea. They didn't have a plan for anything. But yet they want to spend all this in information time critiquing what you came up with to try to show why it doesn't work versus how it should be working and then call themselves being positively engaging in the conversation. Everyone, don't go anywhere. We're up against a break. King, hold on. All the lines are lit. We're going to get everyone in on the conversation on today because our energy is going to always stay up. We're the lions in this jungle of life. And when we roar, we mean business. Don't go anywhere. We'll be back.